with uh, Ilya Shevrev, who will uh, talk to us about stochastic quantization of gauge theory, and I'm happy to offer him a medal, which uh, the uh, Congress is offering to all uh, invited speakers. You can start. Okay, so thank you very much for the kind invitation. Um, so, pleasure to speak here. Um, okay, so. Uh, do I have the pointer actually? Oh, yes, yes, sorry, yes, sorry. It's here. Thanks. <laughs> okay, so um, I, I want to speak about uh, two papers that are joint work with um, AJ Chandra and Martin Heiberger, who are at Imperial College London, and with Hal Shen, who's at the University of Wisconsin Madison. So, this is um, on the topic of stochastic quantization of gauge theories. So just to set the scene first, um, uh, we're, we'll be speaking about Euclidean quantum field theory, so constructive Euclidean quantum field theory. And there are two main ingredients that, go in, uh, that, that, that we begin with. So the first one is a configuration space, or, or a state space, I'm going to call it, uh, which is just a collection of fields. So it's a space of fields that take, uh, go from RD into a vector space E. And the second ingredient is an action on the space. So at this stage, it's just a positive function on, on the state space. And I'm always going to call the state space omega. So given these two ingredients, uh, the goal of constructive uh, QFT is to make sense of a certain probability measure on omega. So um, this, uh, the probability measure is given by a formal Lebesgue measure, dA. And we're going to weight it by exponential of minus this action. Um, so it's this Gibbs type probability measure. So as, as, sure, thanks. Oh yeah, yeah, thanks. <laughs> okay, so um, as many people are aware, um, this is uh, typically a very ill-defined object. So just to begin with, there's no Lebesgue measure, of course, on, on the space of fields. So this is an infinite dimensional space. And uh, on top of this, actions typically contain nonlinearities. Uh, and these nonlinearities typically need renormalization to be made sense of. So this is because we expect this um, probability measure to be supported on distributions rather than functions. And we, we, there's no analytically well-defined way to multiply distributions. So I'm going to narrow it down a little bit now. Um, oops, sorry. So I'm going to narrow it down a little bit now and speak about the kind of theories that I'm interested in, which, is, which are gauge, gauge theories, and most specifically Yang-Mills theories. So here, uh, remember we needed two, two ingredients for, to begin uh, sort of talking about a quantum field theory. So here, the space of um, uh, the, the state space is going to be the collection of one forms uh, defined on RD that take values in a Lie algebra. And I'm going to take this Lie algebra to be uh, that of a compact matrix Lie group G. Um, so if you want to fix one uh, Lie group throughout the talk, just think of G as being equal to SU3. And then the associated Lie algebra is the three by three complex matrices that are traceless and skew Hermitian. And this corresponds to the physical uh, theory of quantum chromodynamics, uh, in four dimensions at least. Um, so you can think, so this is uh, the space of, uh, the state space is just a, um, a space of fields that take values at the end of the day in a vector space. So G to the D if you like. So think of this as a, a function with d components, where the dth component, or each component is a function from Rd into the Lie algebra. Okay, and then the second ingredient is the, is the Yang-Mills action. So I've written it here in, in two ways. Uh, so it's essentially just the L2 norm of the curvature of this one form. So when we think about it as matrices, it's most easily interpreted in terms of this, um, um, uh, oops. Uh, in, in this sort of second way over here. So in terms of the trace of the square of F. And F here, uh, the so-called curvature, is, is given by this, uh, by this expression. And it's, uh, so it's anti-symmetric in I and J. And, um, and it's important to note that it's, uh, it's non-linear in A, so it has this quadratic term. And that makes it, uh, that makes uh, uh, sort of Yang-Mills theories with non-abelian gauge groups uh, reasonably challenging to study. Uh, so, and then just to remind you, we want to make sense of this probability measure mu. So, um, something that on top of these difficulties with there not being a Lebesgue measure and the, the, necess uh, the necessity to renormalize, um, an important feature of these, um, of these gauge theories um, and uh, sort of their defining feature is that there's an infinite dimensional group of, of symmetries. 
So to define this, so the symmetry group, um, take any, any function little g from rd into the Lie group and take a one form a. We're gonna define a new one form ag with these two guys. So the ith component of ag is just the ith component of a conjugated by g. And then I subtract off partial ij g inverse. Um, and then we're going to define an equivalence relation on the space of, of, of one forms. So we're gonna say that a and b are gauge equivalent if b is equal to ag for some function g of this type. So in this setting, just, uh, so in this setting, just think of everything as being smooth for now. So um, one can check that uh, applying such a so-called gauge transformation, so sending a to ag, um, this doesn't change the action. So the action is invariant under this very large group of, uh, of symmetries. So what this means is that the true state space for the theory is not actually omega, it's uh, omega quotient by this gauge equivalence relation. So we really want to measure on um, this uh, quotient space, uh, but this quotient space is usually nonlinear. So it uh, it's usually has actually quite a complicated structure. Okay, so this is an additional difficulties that, that is um, special to gauge theories. Um, okay, so there are, there are quite a few contributions to trying to make a rigorous meaning for this um, so-called Yang-Mills measure. So in two dimensions, uh, there's been quite a successful program uh, which exploits a very special solvability property of, of, of two-dimensional Yang-Mills. Um, so essentially, one can write down a formula for how the, the measure should uh, evaluate certain observables. And this class of observables is large enough to essentially characterize the measure if it were defined on, a, on this quotient space of, of, of one forms. And so uh, these formulas appeared first in the physics literature by, by Migdal back in the 70s. Uh, and the, in the mathematics community, they were taken up a little bit later by Rosking and Segupta, Driver, Levy, and then others. So um, in three and four dimensions, much less is known because there's no known solvability properties of the, of, of the angles measure. Um, and the state-of-the-art results are um, uh, a, a collection of papers by, by Balaban and also by Federbush in the 80s and 90s, and also Manian Rivaso and Senor in 93. Um, and uh, the outcomes of these works is essentially an ultraviolet stability property for, for the measure in finite volume. So if you work on the torus instead of the, the whole Euclidean space. Um, so it's important to know that uh, these, these, these works um, they, uh, there's still work to be done uh, in, in sort of if one wants to define, a, uh, actually achieve the goal of defining a probability measure or even correlation functions for this probability measure, which is actually at the end of the day what you, what you really want to build a quantum field theory. So, um, so there's still actually quite a lot that needs to be done in order to, to sort of solve the Yang-Mills problem even in three dimensions. Okay, so in this talk, I'm gonna speak about a method of um, uh, so a method that we've explored to study this, um, this, this measure, which is based on stochastic quantization. And I'm gonna work in two and three dimensions. So uh, stochastic quantization was introduced by Nelson Parisi Wu uh, in the physics literature. And uh, um, the, the basic idea is that we want to interpret this probability measure mu that we're interested in as the invariant measure for a Langevin dynamic. So the, the natural Langevin dynamic given by this action. So we're gonna introduce a fictitious time direction, and we're gonna look at time evolving fields. So this time has nothing to do with original time in, in Euclidean space. Um, so uh, yeah, so it's given by this, um, uh, so it's given by a kind of a gradient flow structure, and then we perturb this gradient flow by, um, by white noise. This white noise is the natural white noise that comes from the same inner product that we use to define the gradient. Uh, so in the case of, of, of Yang-Mills, this will be just the L2 norm on the space of one forms. Um, so uh, this is not specific to gauge theories at all, although actually Parisian Wu introduced it for, for gauge theories. But one can uh, attempt to study quantum field theories. Um, uh, well, one can attempt to study any quantum field theory using this stochastic quantization procedure. And this has been very successful recently uh, in the study of scalar or bosonic theories. So like, for example, the 5,4-D measures. So uh, there, were, there have been contributions in the last four or five years from Jean-Christophe Morat, Hendrik Weber, um, Massimiliano Gubinelli, and, and others. And one can, so one can use, by setting this equation sort of well enough, one can actually derive properties of the measures. For example, one can use this to show Osterwalder-Schrader axioms, um, obtain tail bounds, uh, things of the such. 
Okay, so we wanted to uh, use this technique of stochastic quantization to see if we can teach us something about uh, Yang Mills. Um, so to, to pass from scalar theories to gauge theories. So I'm gonna present the kind of the main result that, that we have in this direction, and then afterwards I'm gonna focus down on, uh, sorry, on one particular aspect of this, um, of, this, uh, of this result. So we're gonna restrict, as I said, to two and three dimensions, and we're gonna work on compact space. So we're gonna work on the torus instead of RD. So let's introduce um, a collection of white noises. So this is this natural white noise. So it's um, um, one form, the algebra-valued white noise. Uh, so D I I D copies of a, G, uh, of a G valued white noise. And we're gonna mollify it. And we're gonna mollify it with a non-anticipative mollifier, which means that the mollified noise at time t uh, only depends on the real noise uh, t at time before t. So this uh, Xi epsilon, if you like, is adapted to the natural filtration generated by Xi. Then the statement of the theorem is that there exist linear operators C epsilon uh, on the Lie algebra. And uh, in, in, in two dimensions, uh, this uh, sequence of linear operators uh, actually converges, so it, it's, it's finite. Uh, in three dimensions, it diverges, uh, like one over epsilon. Um, uh, so, uh, so there exists this, uh, this collection of linear operators indexed by epsilon, um, such that the solution to the following semilinear parabolic PDE, on which I will comment on in a second, um, converges to a continuous and time stochastic process, A, which I'm gonna call the SYM, or the stochastic Yang-Mills process. Um, and it takes values in a state space omega. Um, moreover, um, the, if we project this process down appropriately to, um, to the quotient space, so, so there exists a natural um, uh, equivalence relation on the state space omega, which generalizes gauge equivalence. And if we project A down to this space, we get a continuous and time Markov process. And uh, all of these statements are modulo blow up. So we don't actually know that these processes survive for all time. So, um, so really there's a caveat that one has to add sort of a cemetery state to all of these things and then adjust the statements appropriately. But I've, um, I've ignored that here because it, it makes the statements quite difficult to read. Um, okay, so let me comment on this equation. So the first part of the equation is just the usual uh, gradient flow that, that we saw before. Um, uh, and the, the last term is the, is the mollified noise. So uh, the, the, the blue term, uh, this is a new term that we've added. So this is the so-called Turk term. And uh, its purpose is to make the equation parabolic. So without this equation, the, uh, without this term, the equation actually is, is non-parabolic. So we, there's trouble in even defining local solutions for it uh, w without this term. Um, and uh, it's sort of, it's a, it's a perfectly okay thing to add because it always acts tangentially to gauge orbits. So what this means is that when you project the process down, um, you don't change the dynamic downstairs on the, on the, um, on the quotient space. Okay, so um, in the, the, the green term is, um, is a counter term. So this is how renormalization manifests itself in this, uh, in this setting. Um, it's, uh, so it serves two purposes. So it, in three dimensions at least, it serves to make the equation converge. Without this term, you won't be able, uh, the equation will just blow up and uh, sort of as epsilon goes to zero. Um, and, uh, uh, and the second, uh, its second purpose is um, to render gauge covariance in the epsilon to zero limit. So at e positive epsilon, uh, this statement about uh, the projection being a Markov process is just not gonna be true. So at, at positive epsilon, you're, you're really breaking uh, kind of gauge covariance. But uh, uh, sort of one of the main statements of this theorem is that it's restored when you send epsilon to zero, provided that you choose C epsilon in a very particular way. Okay, so, um, so I'm not gonna say uh, that much about uh, how we prove the convergence of this equation. So uh, maybe just a final note. I, uh, I haven't written down the equation in the coordinates because I don't think it reveals anything much more about, about the equation, but I have written down kind of the, how the terms look like. So in the second line, it's essentially a parabolic equation. So the leading, uh, the principal symbol is the, is the heat operator. Uh, and then it's quadratic in A and the derivative of A and cubic in A. So these are how the nonlinearities look like. So, um, uh, right, so, uh, so I'm not gonna say that much about uh, how we prove convergence of this, uh, of this, of this equation. Uh, we use uh, the theory of regularity structures and adapt it in, a, in an appropriate way. Um, 
Uh, but uh, what I want to focus on for the for the rest of the talk is how to um, uh, how to construct or, or, or define the state space omega and how to extend gauge equivalent to the space in a canonical way. So I think this is a uh, kind of a, a, a nice uh, standalone result that could be can be explained relatively shortly. Okay, so um, I'm going to focus also on the three-dimensional case because I think that's, uh, that's the more interesting situation. But let me just say a couple of words uh, on the two-dimensional case. So in two dimensions, one can define uh, the state space omega as a holder function space on line se segments. So one can treat one forms as, as functions on lines just by taking line integrals. And uh, this actually, in, in two dimensions, when one looks at uh, two-dimensional quantum fields, this is a, uh, still a perfectly good thing to do because you know, the typical quantum field, like even the Gaussian free field, it can actually be integrated along a line. So it's not, uh, it, it can be restricted to, to lines and thus integrated. So, um, and actually as you move along a line and you integrate the Gaussian free field, you end up with an almost Lipschitz function. So, so in some sense, the Gaussian free field is almost an L infinity function, but it's, but it's uh, as I'm sure many people know, it's not, it's not actually an L infinity function, but it's almost one. And so one can actually do, use this. So as you move along the, uh, a line, uh, you end up with, a, with an almost Lipschitz function, and that's good enough to use Young integration theory to, to define holonomies for the Gaussian free field. Uh, so, so one can then use holonomies to actually extend uh, the notion of gauge equivalence to, to the whole state space. Um, and uh, and uh, on, on top of this, one can actually construct the, uh, the two-dimensional Young-Mills Young measure on this quotient space. So this was um, in, a, in, in, in a paper from a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, this result actually, so the construction of the, the two-dimensional Yang-Mills measure had nothing to do with stochastic quantization. Actually, it started off from a lattice model and then uh, passed to the, to the continuum limit using gate, appropriate gauge fixing. So, so it's, the, this was, so actually relating that construction and the, the two-dimensional Yang-Mills measure in general to the stochastic quantization uh, picture, even in two dimensions, is, is currently open. So we, 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 there's, no, there's, no, there's no proof con uh, or no statement con uh, connecting the two yet. Um, okay, so uh, this, such a simple definition doesn't work in three dimensions. So uh, this is essentially because the Gaussian free field in three dimensions is, is more singular and it can't be restricted to lines anymore. So you can't define uh, the line integral of the Gaussian free field. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off with, with one guess for omega and we're going to refine it a couple of times. Um, uh, and I'll try to motivate kind of the step behind each one of these refinements. So to make a first naive guess, let's first fix, fix a kappa positive but arbitrarily small. I think like one over 100 will do. Um, and we're going to first define omega as the space of hold the best of distributions. Um, of regularity minus one half minus kappa. And this choice comes about because uh, the Gaussian free field and in fact the stochastic heat equation, they take values inside of the space. So this is a classical result in stochastic analysis. Okay, so at least we have some, a, a, a state space uh, that uh, kind of contains distributions that look like the Gaussian free field. So there's a good chance uh, we should be able to solve the stochastic Yang-Mills equation inside of the state space. Okay, so now the question is how do we extend gauge equivalence to the state space? So the idea behind extending, um, so remember, colonomies are ill-defined, and that's how we usually define gauge equivalence. So uh, we need a different route. So what we're going to do is we're going to find a family of linear uh, regularizing operators. Uh, so I'm going to call these FT, indexed by, by parameter T, which I'm going to think of as time. And I want these regularizing operators to satisfy two properties. So the first is, is gauge covariance, which means that for, at least for smooth one forms, um, uh, two smooth one forms A and B, A is gauge equivalent to B if and only if F of T of A is gauge equivalent to F of T of B for all positive times T. Okay, and then uh, the second property that I wanted to satisfy is that I want this to, for all positive T, I want this to be a continuous function from my state space omega into the um, smooth function, or smooth one forms. And so this is what, what we mean by regularizing. Um, and then if we can find such a family of operators, then we can actually extend gauge equivalence to omega simply by taking this expression that I've labeled as S1 um, uh, as a definition. So because f of t of a and f of t of b are smooth, uh, are smooth one forms, makes, the right-hand side makes perfect sense, and then I use that to, to define what I mean on the left-hand side. 
Okay, so a well-known gauge covariant regularizing operator is actually uh, very closely related to this Langevin dynamic for, uh, that I used to, to construct the stochastic yang mills um, process. So this is the deterministic uh, yang mills flow. So it looks exactly the same as, as the, as the Langevin dynamic, except there's no noise and th thus no renormalization either. And just to remind you, the nonlinearities look like x dx and x cubed. So uh, I'm going to take my one form A and I'm going to use it as an initial condition for this uh, deterministic flow. Um, and then uh, at time t, I'm gonna call this f of ta. So um, uh, at this stage, we immediately see, actually see a problem with our initial um, uh, sort of guess for, for omega, is that the state space is way too large. So it's too large um, because uh, actually, uh, uh, so the, uh, the critical um, space at which you can, you can start the deterministic yang mills flow was from, is in uh, C minus one half. Uh, so, and actually a little bit, you have to be a little bit better than that. So you, you can't even start it from C minus one half. And so this is, um, uh, so I wanna just sketch the reason behind this because it, um, uh, it reveals how to, how to fix the problem. So, uh, so classical shatter or, or uh, classical properties of, of hold the of spaces tell us that the L infinity norm of, of A, when we hit it with the heat flow, uh, it blows up like T to the minus a quarter and its derivative blows up like T to the minus three quarters. Uh, a little bit worse than that because we're, we have this cap up uh, flying around as well. Uh, and this is, this is quite bad. So if you try to, for example, solve this equation using Picard iterations, on the first iterant, you're gonna run into a non-integrable singularity. So, so you're gonna hit this, hit this infinity. So this is why you can't start uh, the equation from C minus one half minus kappa. Uh, so it's, it's, it's really due to this product in the, in, in, in the, in the equation. So it's, this product doesn't allow us to define this, uh, doesn't allow us to extend FT as a continuous function. Okay, but actually uh, it's worth remarking that this was the only problem. So if, um, uh, if we shrink our state space down uh, to essentially hard code the fact that these uh, um, uh, nonlinearities behave in a, in a good way, um, then, then we're actually gonna be okay. So we're going to redefine our state space uh, using a new metric. So we're gonna introduce a metric on one forms where the first part of the metric is just the usual uh, hold, hold the norm like we had before. Um, and the, uh, the second part is that is this sort of, we're, we're controlling the, the quadratic term that was giving us problems before. Okay, so if we, if we make this definition, then it's uh, sort of uh, the argument that I, I, I laid down before, it doesn't work anymore. And actually you can actually extend the, the yang mills heat flow as a local Lipschitz map from omega to, to smooth connections, or to smooth, to smooth one forms for, for, for T sufficiently small. And then you can define gauge equivalence in omega in the way that I described. And this is a, so we've shrunk the state space down, but we haven't shrunk it down too much in the sense that uh, the stochastic yang mills process will still actually take values inside of the state space. And that's, uh, so th that's a good thing to do. We don't wanna shrink it so much down that it doesn't support distributions that look like the Gaussian free field. Okay, so unfortunately, it's not quite the end of the, of the story. And, uh, and the rest of the talk, I wanna describe the missing ingredient that we need to add to the state space because I think it's somehow the most interesting part of this, uh, of this construction. So, uh, so I wanna motivate it first. Um, so in the construction of the, of the Markov process, the crucial idea is the following lemma. So, so this, this, uh, from this lemma, it, follow, it, kind of, um, it will follow that, um, that the projected process is Markov. So um, consider the Langevin dynamic started from two gauge equivalent initial conditions, A and B. And suppose that they're related by smooth gauge transformation for sake of argument. Um, so what the lemma tells us is that we can couple the two Langevin dynamics uh, in such a way that B is equal to AG, where G solves a particular PDE. And this PDE essentially looks like the har harmonic map flow, uh, except it has an extra sort of term which drives the equation, this term depends on A. Um, and the initial condition for this, for this equation is, um, is just the, the initial G naught that we had. Um, uh, and this, this holds true provided that um, uh, the, uh, some, the, this, uh, this gauge transformation G, this time evolving gauge transformation G, doesn't blow up in some holder space of positive uh, regularity. And so, so the reason that you don't want it to blow up is because essentially if you look at the Langevin dynamics from A and B, so for all positive times, 
uh, you have this gauge transformation G taking A to B, but if this gauge transformation happens to, to blow up at, at some time before A and B run off to infinity, which, which they very well might, um, you, you don't know what's gonna happen after this point in time that G blows up. So you, you really don't want G to blow up before either A or, 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 or B do. Um, so, so, this is, so essentially to apply this lemma in an effective way, one needs to be able to control uh, the Holden norm of, of G using A and AG. And this, so you need a Holden, a Holden norm of positive um, exponent because this equation for G can only be started off. It can't be started from L infinity. You have to start it off from a slightly, slightly better space than L infinity. Okay, so it turns out that it's quite difficult or probably even impossible to do this using PDE methods alone. So, but it's possible to do it by introducing an extra component into this uh, state space omega. So the extra component is going to be a norm, which we're going to define, um, so we're going to define it as follows. So pick A just to be a smooth one form for now. We're gonna hit A with the heat flow, uh, so uh, e, uh, e, e to the T lambda, and we're going to look at its, uh, all of its line integrals against very short lines. And as the heat flow time goes to zero, the length of these lines is going to also go to zero. So this is this, um, this part which is uh, here. So this, we're gonna look at, uh, gonna take this kind of holder type norm, but the length of the lines uh, gets smaller as t gets smaller. And then we're going to divide this, these line integrals by the length of L to the, to the power of um, uh, one half minus kappa. And then we're gonna take the supremum over um, of, 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 uh, of foot t between zero and one. Uh, so then finally we're gonna define uh, omega as the closure of smooth functions under this, under this metric. Um, so the metric is this, the same metric we had before, plus uh, a minus b uh, under, this, um, uh, under this new norm. So the, the purpose of, uh, of this norm is that it allows you to, um, to prove uh, um, uh, the following essentially purely deterministic statement. Uh, so this deterministic statement follows from, essentially follows again from Young integration theory and, uh, and kind of PDE estimates. Um, so, um, so the statement is that the, uh, there exists some holder exponent nu, such that the uh, new holder norm of G is controlled by some polynomial to do with um, A and AG, so how far they are uh, under this metric from, from the zero or one form. And then again, it's very important to know that we, we've shrunk our state space down once more, but, um, uh, but we haven't shrunk it down too much. So distributions like the Gaussian free field will still belong to, to this new definition of omega. Um, so in particular, uh, this norm will be finite for, for the Gaussian free field. And so this is, this is where, where it's very important to take, um, uh, take this shrinking parameter, so take the supreme over shrinking line segments, because as I said before, if I fixed an L and I sent T to zero, uh, because the Gaussian free field can't be integrated along a line, uh, this is guaranteed to be uh, to be to, to blow up. So, uh, so if I didn't, if we didn't shrink the the, the length of the line segments, uh, this would uh, have no chance to to support distributions that look like the Gaussian free field. Um, okay, so um, with that, I think uh, I'd like to sort of uh, just give a give a summary now of the talk. So. Um, so in conclusion, we've built a, a nonlinear uh, metric space of distributional one forms. Um, we, there's a, a natural way to extend gauge equivalence to this, um, uh, to the space of distributions. And uh, the stochastic Young-Mills process takes values in this, in, in, in the state space. And moreover, it projects down to a, to a canonical uh, Markov process on, on the quotient space. And again, um, um, modular blow up. So, um, okay, so that's not quite, um, uh, so, Okay, that's, that's our main result. Unfortunately, so that's not quite the end of, the, of this kind of program if one wants to study the angles measure. So what's missing is that we don't know that this Markov process actually has an invariant measure or even that it survives for all time. So uh, if one could show that it had an invariant measure, then this would really be um, kind of the first, uh, I guess, complete construction of the three-dimensional Yang-Mills measure, at least in finite volume. Um, so one can consider also uh, other um, supposedly, uh, well, from some perspective, simpler, simpler models like the Yang-Mills-Higgs model and, uh, and try to do this in two, in two dimensions as well. So, so this, is, uh, uh, this is still open as well. Uh, and then uh, finally, it will be quite interesting to try and extend this to infinite volume. So you're probably relatively different. So some new ideas will be necessary there as well. Okay, so with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention.
Thank you for this beautiful talk. Questions, yes. Yes, uh, can you give some additional detail on, on this uh, C epsilon operator? Uh, specifically, how does it behave with, with epsilon, more or less, or uh, how does it behave uh, uh, in terms of, I mean, is a pseudo differential operator behaving like uh, derivative to some power? Yes, and, sorry, and, and just last, uh, does it have the interpretation of the renormalization of the um, uh, gauge uh, coupling strength or something like that? So this is, uh, just to confirm, this is about the C epsilon operators. Yes. Um, so uh, so they'll typically, so in three dimensions, they will diverge like one over epsilon. Uh, it's given as a, um, uh, so it's essentially defined in terms of the Casimir of the Lie algebra that you're looking at. Um, in terms of its uh, interpretation as uh, renormalizing the coupling strength, so, we, um, uh, there's no, in some sense, coupling parameter here in a, um, uh, so in, at least in the stochastic quantization picture. If you start from a, from a, from a lattice, um, of course you'll have to scale, scale the coupling parameter up. Um, uh, but I think it's, uh, yeah, I think it, it arises. Maybe that was just, uh, so it, does, does it have an interpretation in terms of, uh, the coupling something, no, I don't know, something that is stressed by the... Uh, I, think, I think not, no, no. Okay. Yes, please. Uh, what are the chances that something like this would work in four dimensions? <laughs> um, so as presented, uh, very little. <laughs> Um, so we, we really critically use the fact that this is super renormalizable. Um, um, yeah, so, so you would need uh, quite a lot of new ideas to do it in four dimensions. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, Hendrik, are you... Are you yeah, um, uh, can I also ask a question? I don't see what's happening in the theater. Uh, I'm not sure you're supposed to. I'm just, I was just asking if there are any questions from the audience. Ah, okay. Uh, let me see. From the like online audience. Uh, yeah, give me a sec. I I don't think so, but let me see. No, nobody. Okay, so uh, I guess uh, everything else was clear. <laughs> okay, so let's thank the speaker again. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, is Tom already online? Can we start the talk? Hi. Tom, yeah, can you hear? Me, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, good. Okay, so, okay, good. Okay, so, uh, second speaker, we are for the second speaker, we are very happy to have uh, uh, Tom Hutchcroft. Uh, yeah, well, I don't know which uh, uh, continent he's in right now, but uh, maybe he'll explain. And uh, he will talk about the new approach to critical percolation. It will be as Thanks. exciting um, as it sounds. Okay. Uh, so I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, so uh, the, the idea of my talk, I really want to tell you about a kind of a new method that I've been developing for studying critical percolation in particular, so Bernoulli percolation, but it, we'll see it also has some applications to other models. And um, I'm going to sort of illustrate this through the primary example of long range percolation, but as I'll talk about at the end, uh, there are quite a few settings where this new method has been useful. Um, and in fact, uh, it was first developed in the context of doing percolation in kind of non-Euclidean geometry, like uh, non-amenable non groups, things like that. Um, so a nice part of this story is it's really a case where the study of statistical mechanics models or percolation in these non-standard geometric contexts is given new insights back into the sort of classic Euclidean models. Okay, so, um, so just so we're all, all on the same page, what do I mean by percolation? Well, uh, we take some graph G and we just flip a coin for every edge. It has some probability P of being heads. If we see heads, we keep the edge and we call it open. If we see a tails, we delete the edge and we call it closed. Okay, and we call the connected components clusters 
And generally, we're interested in understanding, understanding the geometry of these clusters and how this geometry changes as the parameter P is varied. Okay. Now, of course, uh, as, as most of you probably know, you know, the first thing that really makes this model interesting is that it does undergo a phase transition. So, for example, if you're on, the, uh, on a lattice of dimension at least two, then you have a phase transition. So that means if I define PC to be the infimal value of P, where I get an infinite cluster with positive probability, in fact, it has to be probability one by uh, common goal zero one one law, then PC is strictly between zero and one. Okay. And um, of course, in the specific case I have on the screen of the square lattice, it's a famous theorem of Harry Keston from the 80s that PC is equal to a half. Um, but if you're new to percolation, you shouldn't be misled by this. So in most examples, for example, in the cubic lattice, uh, we don't expect to be able to compute PC exactly or for it to have any kind of interesting value. It's probably uh, not an algebraic number, for example, although we certainly don't have to prove that. Now, once you know that infinite, uh, the, the model undergoes a phase transition, right, it becomes very interesting in particular to try to understand its critical behavior. So the first qualitative question that you'd like to understand is, well, we know when we're below PC, there are no infinite clusters. Above PC, there are infinite clusters. What about at PC itself? Okay, and this is a very difficult problem, as you'll know, particularly in sort of inter intermediate dimensions, like three dimensions, for example. Okay, but really, we'd like to go beyond this. First of all, we believe in great generality that there will not be any infinite clusters at criticality. Um, and then we'd like to understand critical exponents. So, you know, we expect the big critical clusters to have kind of all this rich geometry, which will be captured in part by these critical exponents. So, for example, uh, the probability that the cluster at the origin is large, should decay like some power of, of n. Okay. Now, uh, again, this is probably familiar to most of you. The, there's a whole mean field theory of these uh, critical exponents. You know, if you're on, uh, for example, if you're on a regular tree, then percolation, well, it's just the same thing as a branching process. So you can compute how everything works exactly. You get these simple exponents and um, the mean field theory says that you know when you're in high dimensions, you get should get the same behavior on a lattice as on a tree, uh, and this has been proven um, by Har and Slade in the 90s for sufficiently high dimensions. But then, when you're in lower dimensions, different critical expecting different critical exponents are expected to hold, and this is something that's very poorly understood, particularly in three, four, and five dimensions. So in two dimensions, there's of course all this rich theory connections to SLE, conformal field theory, and so on, uh, where you can actually compute these things. But for example, in three dimensions, we have no idea. Now, as I said, the, this talk is really going to be about a new method to study percolation in settings where we don't completely understand what's going on. So, you know, um, a problem with the existing methods, let's say the 2D methods or the high dimensional methods, they really rely somehow on knowing exactly what you want to prove and, you know, proving everything in one go, like getting a very strong picture kind of right away. This is just an approach that's not going to be available, for example, in three dimensions, because we just don't, you know, maybe one day we will, but currently we don't have any idea, you know, how how we should describe the critical model. So if we want to, for example, prove that there's no, that there's no infinite clusters of criticality, we're probably going to need some kind of um, method that is sort of less sharp somehow. It, it, we, we shouldn't pin our hopes on being able to completely understand everything. And that, that's kind of the idea of the new method I want to present. So as I said, this is kind of nicest for long range percolation. So how does long range percolation work? So instead of having starting with a lattice and then thinning out the edges randomly, we're going to start with the, just the points in the hypercubic lattice, said B, and no edges to start with. And then for each pair of vertices that uh, we'll put an edge between them with this probability one minus E to the minus beta, 
times the distance to the minus d minus alpha. Okay, now this um, specific function here is not very important. The point is that this is between zero and one, so it makes sense. And it decays like uh, beta, which is this sort of intensity parameter, times the norm to the minus d minus alpha when the distance is large. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll think of this alpha as being a fixed parameter, and then beta is this intensity that plays the role that p played before. Okay. Now, um, this model also undergoes a phase transition similar to nearest neighbor calculation. So if you're in more than one dimension, then it always undergoes a phase transition. And if you're in one dimension, it undergoes a phase transition if and only if alpha is less than or equal to one. By the way, the reason we write the exponent this way, the minus d minus alpha, is that this model becomes less interesting when alpha is zero or negative, because uh, in, in that case, every vertex will have infinite degree almost surely. So the model no longer undergoes a phase transition in that regime. So we, we want the exponent to be strictly bigger than d in order to get a model that has a phase transition. So Poisson range percolation is still interesting in other regimes, but it, the questions one would look at would be different. Now, um, the interesting thing is you might think this model might be harder to understand than nearest neighbor percolation. But in fact, our understanding of long range percolation is quite a lot better than nearest neighbor percolation in several cases. So in particular, it's a theorem of known burger from 2002, that the model undergoes a continuous phase transition when alpha is, whenever alpha is strictly less than D. Okay, and by continuous phase transition, I mean that there are no infinite clusters. Okay. And in general dimensions, this is best possible because it's also a theorem of Eisenman and Newman that when you're in one dimension and alpha equals one, you actually get a discontinuous phase transition. So you actually do have an infinite cluster at criticality. And this example is really important because, you know, for example, if you want to prove that there's no infinite clusters at criticality, on the three-dimensional lattice, well, you, you better make sure that your argument doesn't apply to this long-range example in one dimension. It's actually not so easy to think of arguments where, you know, where which wouldn't this wouldn't work for. So it's a it's actually quite a serious barrier. Um, and uh, another thing about this model is that this. Um, this proof of Berger, it really applies to models that are not mean fields. So for the for long range percolation, we expect mean field behavior to hold either when the dimension is bigger than six, which is the same conditions under which mean field behavior should hold for the nearest neighbor model, or when alpha is less than d over three. Okay, so the smaller alpha is, the longer, the easier it is to have long edges. Um, just to give you some indication of why this condition alpha less than d is important. Um, so that there's a sort of a geometric change that happens in the model when alpha is equal to d. So suppose you take two boxes of, that have side length n and are separated by a distance of order n as well. Then when alpha is smaller than d, you actually get a large number of edges between these two boxes with high probability. When alpha is equal to D, you get sort of an order one plus only a number of edges. And when alpha is bigger than D, you get no edges with high probability. So that's um, one indication of why this condition alpha less than D might be important. Okay. Now, the, the main um, result that I want to explain the proof of is um, this uh, so, so Berger's theorem, it tells you that when alpha is less than d, that there are no infinite clusters of criticality. But it doesn't really tell you anything more than that. It doesn't give you anything quantitative about critical population. Basically, the reason for that is the way his proof works is he says, he essentially proves that the set of beta where infinite clusters exist is open. So he says, suppose you have some beta, suppose I have an infinite cluster with positive probability, then I want to argue that, well, if I decrease beta a bit, I would still have an infinite cluster. Okay. Um, so this kind of argument doesn't tend to tell you very much about the critical model because it's really arguing by looking at the supercritical model. 
So this new proof establishes uh, power law upper bounds on all these quantities. Um, and I think, as far as I know, this is the first time that power law upper bounds have been established for a model of Bernoulli bond percolation, which is not two dimensional or high dimensional. So this really applies to models which are not expected to have mean field behavior and they're not planned. Okay. And indeed, it even includes models that are believed to be in the same universality class as nearest neighbor percolation on Z30, Z4, and Z5. Yeah. And um, in fact, for these models, there's a relatively simple prediction from the physics literature about what should happen. So there are actually exact predictions for what these exponents should be. Um, so for example, if you look at this uh, exponent two minus eta, sorry, sorry, I didn't define this, but this is going to define the, um, the uh, decay of the connection probability between two points. So uh, this exponent eta is defined so that the connection probability between x and y should be like the norm of x minus y to the power minus d plus two minus eta. So when eta is zero, you get minus d plus two, which is Green's function decay, which is characteristic of mean field behavior. Okay. Now, the prediction is just really simple. It's just that when alpha is small, so when alpha is less than d over three, you expect mean field behavior, which should mean that you decay like the Green's function. But for the Green's function on this appropriate long range model, okay, and it turns out that the behavior there is just linear. Okay, but the prediction is that actually this linear dependence on alpha extends beyond the mean field regime and it just continues up until you hit whatever the nearest neighbor value of this experiment is. So there are kind of these two regimes for the model. You have this to the left of this corner where, uh, which you might call the sort of long range dominant phase of the model where the sort of short range stuff isn't important and the, the exponent continues to have this simple behavior like it does when alpha is very small. And then you hit this sort of phase transition in alpha where you start just having the nearest neighbor type behavior. Okay. Um, so, you know, we don't establish this at all, but you can see that our bounds aren't too bad and in particular, they get quite close to the true values around the point where you have this corner. Um, and I should advertise as well that in, in, in separate work, uh, I have been able to rigorously establish this picture for uh, percolation on hierarchical lattices, although it uses quite different methods to what I'm talking about here. Okay. So, Again, the, the point of this talk is it's less about the specific results and more about the method. So I want to take a step back and think, you know, how would we prove that there is no percolation of criticality? And now there's kind of two main approaches that you might follow, um, which I like to think of as what I call the supercritical strategy and the subcritical strategy. So in the supercritical strategy, what you want to do similar to what I mentioned about Berger's proof, you basically want to show that the set of P or beta where infinite clusters exist are open. Okay, so one way you might do this is try to argue that, well, suppose P is such that an infinite cluster exists, then these infinite clusters must be kind of large in some core sense that's strong enough to guarantee that the infinite clusters actually have themselves a non-trivial percolation phase transition, PC less than. Of course, if you can show that, it follows quite easily that uh, you, you weren't really at PC, you were a bit above PC. Okay. So, for example, you might expect that if an infinite cluster existed on ZD, it should kind of look like ZD at sufficiently large scales, which would hopefully uh, guarantee this. Okay. Now, there are lots of variations on this method, and probably this has been the most popular way generally of studying critical population in lots of papers. Um, but again, one downside of this is that, well, first of all, it you know, doesn't always work, obviously, or it doesn't work to our knowledge, but also that arguments of this form tend to give relatively little quantitative information about percolation actually at criticality. 
Now, there's a different way you can approach the problem, which I call the subcritical strategy. And here, what the idea is to prove that the set of P for which infinite clusters don't exist is closed. Okay, now, of course, that's equivalent to what I just said, but you know, it's a different uh, perspective on it. And the way we want to do it is by proving that some estimate that's non-trivial in the sense that it implies that there's no infinite cluster should hold uniformly all the way up to PC. Okay, so often the way this works is by what's called a bootstrapping argument. So what you try to do is you try to prove that some well-chosen upper bound on the distribution of the cluster of the origin, right, that you can choose yourself. Okay, you want this to obviously hold when P is small. And what you want to do is show that this bootstrapping hypothesis implies a stronger version of itself. Okay, now that might seem like a kind of vacuous or silly thing, but in fact, if you can do this, you can deduce by a continuity argument that the strong form of the bootstrapping hypothesis is going to hold uniformly all the way up to PC. So, for example, this isn't really exactly how they do it, but one way you can think about the Harris Slade proof of mean field behavior in high dimensions is, is by a, a bootstrapping argument like this. And basically, what they show is if the dimension is really large and G denotes the Green's function, then you have this implication that if you know that connection probabilities are always bounded by three times the Green's function, then in fact they're always bounded by two times the Green's function. Okay. Of course, proving this inequality is the hard part of the work. But if you can prove this, then you can easily deduce by continuity that this strong estimate with the two holds uniformly uh, all the way up to PC. Basically because, you know, if, if you stopped satisfying the strong form of the estimate at some point, you'd still satisfy the weak one when you've only just started to break it and therefore you'd satisfy the strong one. So, um, yeah, so basically, our method is a new way of doing these kind of bootstrapping arguments. It's based on uh, an idea from, from the paper of Eisman, Kessler, and Newman in 1987, where um, so this was the first paper to prove that in supercritical percolation on the lattice, there is at most one infinite cluster. So most people now learn the proof by Burton and Keane that was a year or two later, which is much easier. But the uh, Eisenman, Kesten, and Newman proof gives you quantitatively quite a lot more information. In particular, it says that if you take a box in ZD and you look at an edge in the middle of the box and you say, what's the probability that the endpoints of this edge lie in distinct clusters, both of which reach the boundary, then it's always bounded by log n over root n. Okay. And I would love to tell you more about the proof of this because it's really beautiful, but basically, they do a very clever sort of um, pointing the order of summation, basically, to transform this probability into something of this form. It's an expectation of a martingale term, ZT, at a stopping time, divided by T on the indicator that the stopping time is large. Okay, and once you've done this transformation, you can easily prove this by a, you know, whatever martingale methods that you'd like to use. Um, now, what, what I did a few years ago is I proved a stronger version, stronger and more general version of this um, inequality, uh, which applies directly in infinite volume. And it also works with the volume of clusters rather than the radius. Um, what it says is, if you let S X N be the event that X and the origin both belong to distinct clusters of size at least N, let's say at least one of them is finite, then you, the, if you sum over the neighbors of the origin, or, or just pick one in the case of the degree that's uh, basically the same, then this is always bounded by one over root n times some kind of universal constants that are very important. Okay. So basically, this is saying this event where you have two distinct big clusters next to each other, of size at least n, it always has probability bounded by one over root n in a totally universal way. In particular, we don't have this log term. That wasn't really needed in the original argument either. Um, let, me, let me skip that remark and come back to it later. So what's the idea of how, how do we use this for one of these bootstrapping 
So here's, here's basically the idea. So, so take this event that X and the origin lie in distinct clusters of sides of least now. Okay. So we can bound this from below by the probability that they both lie in clusters of sides of least n minus the probability they're connected to each other. Okay. Now, percolation is positively associated, right? It satisfies the FKG inequality. So this probability here, I can bound from below by the square of the probability that the origin lies in a large cluster. Okay, so if I rearrange this, I get that the probability of the origins in a large cluster squared is bounded by the sum of this two big clusters probability plus the connection probability. So, so here's how this class of arguments work. What you do is you assume as a bootstrapping hypothesis some well-chosen up bound on the tail of the volume. Okay, now of course choosing this bound is like a large part of the art of pushing these arguments through. Okay. Then what you do is you find some way to convert bounds on the tail of the volume into bounds on connection probabilities. Okay, now I'll, I'll come back to this in a minute. Okay. Then use the two ghost inequality to bound this term and you know this step two, whatever you did to bound the last term. And hopefully, once you rearrange this and take square roots of both sides, you end up with a stronger bound on the tail of the volume than the one that you started with. Okay. And if you manage to execute all these steps correctly, then you will deduce that this strong bound continues to hold at PC. So Hopefully, because it's actually very simple, let's hopefully see how exactly how this works in a simple example. So I'm going to look at long range percolation, but instead of taking alpha all the way up to D, I'm going to assume that it's less than D over two, and I'll prove a worse bound on the exponent, but you know, you'll, you'll get the idea across. Okay, and um, the key step is to prove this bootstrapping lemma. So I'm going to use this value theta that I want to prove this power law of the bound for the body. Okay. And what I want to prove is that if beta is subcritical and not too small, so there exists some constant, so that all this holds uniformly, so that if I have a power law up bound of this form with some uh, leading constant A, then in fact I have the same up bound with the leading constant C times the square root of it. Okay. And I've chosen this exponent theta so that this, this proof will work. Okay. Now, if you can prove this bootstrapping lemma, then you're done. Why is that? Well, for each beta less, less than the subcritical, let's define A of beta to be the best constant that I can put here so that this bound is true. Okay. Now, if I'm really subcritical, then in fact, the, the volume has an exponential tail. So it certainly satisfies this inequality for some value of this, and this, this uh, number is finite. Okay. Now, this bootstrapping lemma implies that this number has to satisfy this inequality, right? A is less than C minus the square root of A. But A is also finite, so I can safely rearrange this and get that A is bounded by C squared. But so, so I found that this inequality holds with a universal choice of C all the way up to B to C, and therefore it holds at B to criticality as well by a simple continuity argument. Okay, so how are we going to prove this bootstrapping lemma. So first of all, I'm going to need a version of this two ghost inequality for long range models. And it looks like this. So it says if I sum over all x in the lattice of the probability of this two large cluster of n squared times this factor, which is basically just beta times, uh, sorry, j is this, um, is the uh, x to the minus, uh, the norm of x to the minus d minus alpha, it's the uh, kernel for putting the edges in. And this should be bounded, this is bounded by a universal constant over n. Okay, so what we do, we take this inequality we had before, star, and we average it over a box whose radius we're going to optimize over shortly. Okay, so we, we get this where we have these um, two large cluster terms and these connection probability uh, point terms. Okay. Now, this first term, you can easily bound using Cauchy Schwartz. You know, you uh, do the obvious manipulations, you, you transform it into something that looks like what we had on the previous slide. And what you get is that this first term is bounded by a universal constant times the square root of r to the alpha over n. 
Yeah, and these are just really simple computations. Okay, and for the second term, so here is where we need to uh, use our bootstrapping assumption to get something out. So we assume that the tail of the volume has this a n to the minus theta upper bound. Then what we can do to bound this sum, well, this is just the expectation of the intersection of the cluster at the origin with the box. Uh, that's bounded by the expectation of the minimum of these two things, which is this. Right, so then if I just use this bound in each term of the sum, and then I do a bit of calculus, I get that this is bounded by some universal constant times a r to the minus d theta. Okay, so I just add these two things together. I get this bound. I, you know, optimize over the choice of the radius of the box. And lo and behold, because I chose theta so that it would work out, I exactly get that this square probability is bounded by a universal constant times a plus one. Again, we can always assume a is bigger than one, and I just take square roots of both sides. So this is, I, I hope you can agree, it's actually a very simple strategy, what given this two ghost inequality as an input, and uh, you know, proves power law upper bounds in models that you know might not have mean field behavior. So to, to improve to get the full statement, the theorem, there's two steps. One is to use the bootstrapping hypothesis to improve what you get out of the two ghost inequality. This is actually quite straightforward. Uh, the second more interesting new step is that we basically this this step here where we bound the expectation of the intersection by the expectation of the minimum this is a terrible bound and to get the full theorem you need to do something better um, and this actually gets into interesting stuff where we prove a new rigorous hyperscaling inequality that gives us a more efficient way to convert volume tail estimates into two-point function estimates but given the time away get into that. Um, just to say, um, you know, that I focus on one application, but this method has been used to do a bunch of, of other similar things. So, for example, we can prove power law upper bounds for percolation on graphs of exponential growth. Um, we can prove that there's no percolation of criticality on some groups of intermediate volume growth, where it's faster than polynomial but slower than exponential. And um, also, you can actually get these arguments to work in some settings that aren't the really. So, in fact, the two ghost inequality it works provided that your model has a representation as percolation in random environments. So, have some way of choosing edge probabilities in a random but translation invariant way and then doing percolation then I have a version of the two ghost inequality. Um, and actually lots of models have representations of this form, including the random cluster model, POTS model, EC model, et cetera. Um, so you can actually get some things out of these. Of course, you know, we're always approximating the critical model by the subcritical. So for example, for random cluster, you'll only learn about the free boundary condition model at criticality, um, which is, which ought to be the case because you know sometimes it doesn't have a continuous phase transition. But as one last application to mention, uh, this method is also used to prove that the Ising model has a continuous phase transition on any non-amenable Cayley graph. So this is actually again we we get all these power law bounds out of it, but even this qualitative result is new, including on you know the most classical examples like tessellations of the hyperbolic plane. The main idea here is to use this bootstrapping methodology, but to study the random current representation of the ET model. And the main difficulty here is that the, this model is not, it doesn't have the FKG property. So the argument actually breaks quite badly and you have to do something else to fix it. I think given I'm already over time, I'll uh, stop there and uh, answer the list. Questions, remarks? Yes. Hey, could you maybe comment on what you think the main obstacles are for applying this subcritical bootstrapping for 
classical percolation on G3C? Yeah. Um, so one of the one of the um, you know things about this argument, which is nice, is that uh, it's quite difficult to see what these obstacles are. I you know I, I I've tried a lot to do it, and there do seem to be obstacles, but you know they seem to be obstacles of a rather technical nature, right? Rather than really being a fundamental obstacle to applying the method, you know. So. I'd say actually the, the, the place where it's very hard to do things efficiently. So, so, um, so in this overall strategy, this rigorous hyperscaling stuff that I mentioned does this second step here in basically a completely optimal way. Like it's as sharp as you could hope for. It really gives you exactly the right thing. Really the difficult thing is this step where you want to bound these probabilities of two large clusters, but when X isn't a neighbor at the origin. Okay, and the thing is when, when we had long range models, everything's a neighbor at the origin. And you know, that, that makes this a lot easier. You don't really need to worry about this. Um, but if, if you're in nearest neighbor models, currently the methods to do this are really inefficient. Yeah, that, that's really the, the thing where there needs to be new ways of doing this more efficiently. So you know, we have good ways of bounding this for neighbors, but you know, to bound it for other things, you do all the kind of surgery arguments and they tend to be very costly. So that, that's, that's really where things need to be improved. Yes. So. So uh, actually, uh, two questions, if possible. One is, uh, if d is larger than one and alpha is larger than d, is the transition expected to be discontinuous? And, and the other is, uh, do you get bounds on critical exponents of uh, easing uh, with long range interactions? Um, okay, so for the first question, no, it's expected to be continuous, so. Um, in fact, you know, we, we even have predictions for what the exponents are. So basically, as soon as you hit this value alpha C, you should stabilize at the, uh, all the exponents being the same as the nearest neighbor. So as alpha goes to infinity, the model kind of approximates the nearest neighbor model in some sense. Um, so we certainly expect a continuous phase transition, although it seems you know, difficult to establish that. Um, so the second question about the Eastern model, um, it does work for the EC model. Everything I showed you works for the EC model. The problem is that the rigorous hyperscaling inequalities are very specific to Bernoulli percolation because they use uh, the BK inequality very heavily. And um, so, so this alpha less than D over two proof that I showed you, this works actually just exactly the same proof works for the EC model, but um, getting all the way up to D, it seems to require something additional. Thanks. Okay, uh, I don't see any other questions from the on-site audience. Uh, any questions from the online audience? No, sorry, no online questions. Well, it's not the end of the world because we are slightly, slightly uh, <laughs> Uh, below schedule. So let's uh, thank uh, Tom again for this interesting talk. Okay. Uh, the last speaker is uh, ready. Okay, good. Oh, there you are. Okay, good. So uh, our last, uh, for the last speaker, we are very happy to have uh, Shirshan Lu Ganguli. Uh, who will tell us about, uh, well, you change topics all the time. Okay, so he'll tell us about uh, uh, last passage percolations. And uh, by the way, I didn't mention it, but both speakers will get the medal by mail. Well, I can certainly get it. Okay, thank you. you can, talk. Um, can you guys hear me? Um, 
Can you guys see yes, me? We can, yes, we can see. And okay. if you can put a full screen, please. Oh, yeah. This is good. It's good. You can start. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So thanks a lot to the organizers for the invitation. Um, yeah. So what I'll talk about today is some recent work that we've been doing to understand uh, certain uh, refined geometric properties and dynamical aspects of uh, certain growth models, um, particularly the aspects of population. And, and most of the talk will be based on uh, Joint work with Alan Hammond, although, and I'll, I'll mention some other related results that we can do as well. Okay, so, um, yeah, so before getting into the specific of the particular model, last specific population, let me just put it in a slightly bigger context. So, it's a, it's a model of planar stochastic growth. Uh, in particular, it's a, it's a part of a class of models that describe random growth and interfaces. Um, which has certain key features. Um, and these include things like uh, slope dependent speed, uh, particularly in a nonlinear way, the dependence is, some global smoothening, and then there are some local random forces that actually drive the growth. And it turns out that under rather general conditions, as long as these features are present, uh, these models are supposed to all behave uh, in a rather universal way. At least their fluctuations uh, should all be sort of governed by the same. Uh, same kind of exponents. And, and this is uh, the prediction of Kurt Operation Zang, uh, which sort of came about in the mid 80s. Uh, but throughout the rest of the talk, I'll sort of focus on one particular growth model. And, 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 and these are sort of examples of random metric spaces. And the growth actually happens to be modeled by the metric box. Um, 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 so a particular example in this class is post class population. So what do you do? It's very simple. You, you simply take the Euclidean geometry and then distort it by some random noise. So let's look at Z2 uh, and look at the uh, nearest neighbor graph structure in Z2. And let's say for every edge on this lattice, you now put a random weight, um, IID random weight. So let's say each edge now has an IID exponential random variable attached to that. And, and that is the length of this uh, edge. So, so if there were no weights, the length of every edge would be one. And now sort of it's now associated to a random length and, and this gives you a random weighted version of Z2. And you can now look at the associated shortest path metric. And this is what post passive population is. And, and what are the key observables? So one would be the distance of the passage time, uh, which will be denoted by TXY. So let's take two points X and Y on Z2 and, and, and TXY will denote the passage time or the distance. And the other key object that we'll be interested in is the geodesic of the shortest path uh, between x and y, and that's going to be denoted by gamma x y. Okay. Uh, now, before getting into anything, let's just point out a key difference that you see in such models, uh, which is different from Euclidean geometry, is how geodesics behave. So, so let's say you have two points which are close to each other, and there are and, and two other points that are also close to each other, and you look at the corresponding geodesics, they tend to typically merge and coalesce for a while, and then eventually go their own way. But this is very different from Euclidean geometry, but the geodesics are the shortest path of straight line. So either they meet at a point or they don't meet at all. And the basic reason behind coalescence is the fact that these random paths are, are length minimizing. They're trying to minimize the length between points. And so they look that, try to go through regions of the space where the random variables are typically low, atypically low. So both the green and the red, uh, blue paths, they typically hit random variables that have low weight and, and in the process they launch. So that's one thing to keep in mind that that's gonna feature quite a lot in our, in our discussion. So coalescence is sort of a key difference that you see in this kind of geometry, random geometry setting. Okay, so uh, so how do metric balls look? So this is a simulation for an FPP metric ball centered at the origin, let's say, uh, with exponential weights. So the limit shape is some convex object, which is not very well understood. Uh, and it actually is not universal. So the, the actual shape, uh, of this metric ball would depend on what exactly the distribution of each uh, edge weight is. And, and, and these colors denote the level curve. So points with the same color are all at the same distance from the origin. However, if you now zoom in on the boundary, the local fluctuation behavior uh, is supposed to be universal. 
uh, regardless of what the original edge weight distribution is. Uh, okay, so what are some of the questions that you can ask for a model like that? So how does, let's say, the distance between points X and Y fluctuate? Or how does the geodesic between points X and Y behave? So these are some very basic questions that you might want to ask. And then you can actually ask more complex questions like what is the correlation structure of the distance between points as the points are allowed to vary. So you can look at the entire distance speed. You can look at metric balls growing from different sources. How do they interact? You can talk about large deviations. Uh, let's say, how does the geodesic between two points behave? If I tell you that the distance is atypically large or small. Um, and so these have all been sort of investigated recently in, in related context. But the focus of the talk today will be a dynamical aspect of this model. So, so I start with this FPP where I have this independent edge weights on every edge. And I want to understand, let's say, what would happen to the distance between points of the geodesics if this underlying noise variables were thought of in time. And, and we look at, a really good thing that one has to understand to answer such questions is how does the energy landscape behave? So, so FPP actually induces an energy landscape where it's, which is indexed by paths, right? So each path has a length and you can think of that as the energy of the path. And, and so that automatically induces uh, energy landscape which you might want to understand the geometry of. Of particular relevance would be uh, to understand the geometry of near ground states. So the geodesic is a path that minimizes length. So, uh, so in some sense, it's, you can think of it as a ground state in the landscape and, 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 and what would be relevant is to understand paths that almost minimize the length, so near ground states. Uh, and, and so in the story of dynamical uh, perturbation of, of underlying noise variables, sharp results are known for critical population, let's say the triangular lattice, using ideas from poor analysis of Boolean functions along with very sharp understanding of uh, what are known as arc probabilities uh, for critical population. And, and one paper to do that would be the paper by Garban, Pitt, and Schramm, which was a follow-up of a whole bunch of other papers and got really refined results. And the broad goal is to sort of build a parallel theory for models in this KPC universality class. Uh, so how do these behave uh, when, when the underlying noise variables are, are dynamically evolving? What are the critical exponents that govern the fluctuations? However, it turns out that uh, all these questions that I sort of mentioned are far from being answered for FPP. And, and, and uh, so we'll actually instead focus on a related variant. And this is uh, what is last research population, which appeared on the slide, on the back of slide, uh, because they actually um, admit some algebraic connections and then you can use some external integrable inputs to, to get very sharp understanding. Although the behavior for FPP is expected to be the same somehow uh, because of some uh, lack of integrability, the, the, the understanding is much less for NP. Okay, so what is last message population? So, so, so what, is the key, what are the key differences from FPP? So, so there are many ways to set this up. So in, at least for the moment, let's just look at this. So look at the um, lattice. And now instead of looking at all of us, can, so again, let's say you get all the vortices in the lattice with some random weights. So every vortex in this lattice has an IID random weight attached to it. And now between two points, you look at some oriented paths. So instead of considering all paths, we'll simply consider all oriented paths, which let's say in this setting or in this orientation, uh, they go either northwest or northeast. And so for any such path between two points, you pick up the sum of the random weights along the path. And that's going to be the energy of this path. And instead of minimizing the distance between two points, I'll maximize the weight of every oriented path. So instead of looking at first passage times, I'll look at maximal passage times, and which I'll denote by LXY. So LXY is you look at all the oriented paths between, let's say, X and Y, and look at the uh, so for each such path, you sum up the weights along the path, and, and you look at the path that maximizes the weight, and LXY is that, is that weight. So it turns out that this sort of modifications actually then lead to algebraic connections if you choose the vortex weights also appropriate. So special just the vortex weights uh, then actually make this model admit uh, connections to random matrices, permutations and other algebraic objects, uh, which I'll not go much into. Uh, and, and they actually lead to very sharp understanding of these models, which you explore. Uh, however, for the actual job, uh, so we'll actually work with a slightly different model, which uh, uh, which is where most refined understanding is currently available. 
And so this is a semi district model. So instead of having vortices where you put random gates, uh, this model will be uh, sort of driven by white noise or drumming motion. So, so, okay, so how does this model go? I'll not be very precise. So, so let's say you have all these copies of R. And instead of having vortices, let's say every copy of R is equipped with a two sided drumming motion. And let's say now you want to go between two points, 0, 0, and N. And you look at some oriented path. What does an oriented path in this setting mean? It means a path which stays for some time on this level, then jumps to the next level, stays for some time there, and eventually makes its way to the destination point NN. So it's always moving to the right or up. And, and what is associated energy to a path like that? It simply picks up the sum of the Brownian increments. So, so you look at this interval, which is the duration of the path on this line. Um, by the way, can you see the pointer actually? Just to make sure. I mean, like my mouse arrow or something. Yes, we see your, uh, the, your pointer, no problems. Okay, yeah, thanks. Yeah, so, so, so the path, let's say, as in the figure, spends this amount of time on this line, so it will pick up the increment of this rounding motion. Then it will add to that the increment of this rounding motion for this interval and so on. So this is exactly the analog of this district model where the IID weights on the vortices are replaced by white weights. And this is what is known as Brownian LPP. So again, uh, to put everything in the same set of coordinate uh, system, it's sort of, it's sort of sometimes convenient to make certain affine transformations. Instead of going between 0, 0, and n, I'll make some affine transformation and actually instead go from 0, 0 to 0. So that's not a very important point. But, and also sometimes height is typically scaled to get the height down from n to order 1. Okay, so I'll, I'll work with this vertical coordinate system where paths will start from zero zero and, and vertically move up. Okay, so what is the KPC prediction? And, and these are things that are actually verified in this model, unlike for FPP. So the KPC prediction is given by, or the fluctuation theory is given by this triple of exponents, one, one third, two third. So what are these exponents? So let's say you look at this path from zero zero to zero n. This energy, which I'll denote by ln, to shorten things. So ln behaves linear, goes linearly in n. So ln, the law of large numbers behaves 2n. So this explains the exponent 1 in this ripple. So now if you center by the stating order term, uh, then you, so the fluctuation term is actually given by n to the one third. So ln minus 2n over n to the one third actually converges to uh, a scaling limit or a distribution, which is uh, known as a Tracy-Witten distribution. Again, for people who are familiar with this, uh, this is uh, uh, this is what arises as a limiting distribution for uh, again values of uh, thousand random matrices as well. And so that gives you the one third exponent. So one third exponent is what governs the weight fluctuation of this path. And the two third exponent is a geometric interpretation. So what it does is, if you look at this geodesic between zero zero and zero n, again I'm abusing terminology. So geodesics are actually supposed to denote shortest paths, but here I'm using the same terminology to denote paths that actually maximize passage techniques. Sometimes they're called polymers in the literature. So if you look at this polymer of the geodesic between 0, 0, and 0, n, if you look at how much it fluctuates from the straight line during the endpoints, that turns out to be into the two thirds. So, so the path is typically confined in a strip of it into the two thirds. And that's the source of this exponent two thirds. So you see that this is quite different from a Brownian bridge between the two corresponding points, which would have fluctuated by only square root of n. Okay, so, so these are the basic predictions that are supposed to uh, um, hold true for a large class of models in this KPC universality class, but currently only verifiable for certain models that have this algebraic properties. Okay, so, but this has been known for a while. And, uh, uh, and so the point is to sort of build on this with sort of more geometric insight and use probabilistic and geometric arguments on top of this integrable inputs to get understanding of dynamical aspects of such models. Okay, so, so what does dynamical Brownian LPP mean? So I have these Brownian motions that drive the model. So these are the underlying noise variables. I have to port up them in time. So, so, so to do that, I set up some notation. So let's say these Brownian motions are this, um, so I'm denoting them by, let's say B0, or B01. So, so the superscript zero denotes the time. So these are the Brownian motions at time zero. And I want to define the Brownian motions at time t. So the corresponding Brownian motions at time t, b0, t, b1, t, and so on. And so how do I do them? So these are Gaussian processes. So natural canonical choice is given by the Onshin and flow. So I won't define it very precisely, but 
but what you can sort of imagine is for people who are not quite familiar with it, so it's a running motion of time t is let's say has this representation, which is like basically exponential of minus t times running motion of time zero, plus an independent running motion term with a suitable prefactor so that it's stationary. So, so the process is stationary. So it, at every time it's uh, standard to standard running motion and the correlation with the running motion of time zero decays with time as exponential of minus t. Okay. So that will be our dynamical model. So given this setup, like you can ask some very basic questions, uh, like how long does it take for, uh, for the energy of a path to decorrelate? So let's say ln zero is the energy of the geodesic of the polymer between zero, zero, and zero, n at time zero, and correspondingly define ln t. So how does the correlation ln zero between ln zero and ln t decay as a function of time t? And, and, and so there is a more geometric question that is also relevant which is how do the geodesics behave as, as the dynamical perturbation evolves? So let's say gamma n zero and gamma n t are the geodesics at time zero and time t. So it's plausible that when time is very short, the geodesics overlap quite a bit. But then as you introduce more and more noise into the system, the geodesics start looking quite different. And so, so you might want to understand how much, what exactly is the time it takes for the geodesics to look quite different from its the time zero structure. And the one way to quantify that is to, uh, sort of look at the overlap function. So you have these two paths and you can look at how much they overlap by and that's a number between zero and n. So at time zero, when t is zero, it's actually equal to n. And as t grows, it becomes smaller and you want to understand when does it become, let's say, little o of n. Because so these are the two questions that you can ask. One about uh, how the position decays and, and, the one, and the other one is more geometric about how the geodesic overlap behaves. Uh, any questions so far? Okay, uh, right. So, so key tool that would be useful for analysis is, um, is something that comes from uh, the Fourier theory of Gaussian spaces and goes by the name of dynamical formula for variance and it was established by Chatterjee in the late 2000s. So it says, uh, and, and this is just um, uh, some playing around with uh, uh, the onshin lindbergh semi group and, and some very basic spectral theory of Gaussian spaces. Uh, so, so it says that the variance of the geodesic weight at time zero or at time t, it's a stationary process, so the variance does not change with time. So the variance actually has a very nice representation in terms of the overlap function. And so in particular, it's integral of e power minus s times the expected overlap between the geodesic at time zero and geodesic at time s, ds. So somehow this formula nicely relates the variance uh, to the expected overlap. And for the returns of this integrand, uh, this expected overlap actually decreases with time. And again, this is a consequence of uh, sort of spectral expansion of these quantities. Um, and so, so you see that this is why we need to work with models where we have a very sharp estimate of the variance. And this is why we rely on the integral models where we have a sharp understanding of how this behaves uh, as a function plan. And so what is the direct consequence of this formula? So you have two direct consequences. Uh, uh, like they need some amount of work, but not too much. The reason to be straightforward to compute. So one is low superoptical overlap. So it turns out, okay, so I'm saying low superoptical overlap, uh, but for that I have to define what the critical location is. So it turns out that this number n to the minus one third is sort of a critical location. And I'll talk more about this soon. So it turns out that if your time is much larger than the minus one third, then the geodesic at time t overlap, the overlap with the geodesic at time zero is already very small, little of n with very high probability. And that's actually a pretty straightforward consequence of the, the formula that I showed in the previous slide. So that's one consequence. So for large times, in the sense that t is much larger than n to the minus one third, the overlap is automatically small from, from the formula. And the other consequence is, other consequence is if the time is very small, if t is much smaller than n to the minus one third, then the weight actually does not change too much. The correlation is high. So the first assertion is about the overlap. That's small when t is large. And the second assertion is about the weight. It says that when t is small, the correlation is actually very high in the sense that the weight at time t and the weight at time t are very close to each other. So the correlation is actually pretty close to one. So these are reasonably straightforward consequences of the formula. And so, which means that if you want to now prove a transition, a dynamical transition, then you have to prove the counterpart results. So the previous slide had two results, one for the overlap, 
in one particular condition, to complete the transitional picture, you have to prove the contraproductive result. You have to either show that for small times, the geodesics overlap a lot, means that meaning that they're stable, or, or alternatively, you can also try to prove that for large times, you decode this. So proving one of these two will actually, at least in some sense, prove that the model undergoes a dynamical phase transition at this location t equal to n to the minus one third. And, uh, and so with Hammond last year, we proved the geodesic version, the, the geometric version. We showed that if t is actually smaller than n to the minus one third with some uh, subpolygonal corrections, uh, then the overlap is indeed macroscopic with high probability. And so this completes the dynamical transition picture. It says, uh, so, so there was already the low superficial overlap. It said that for T large, the overlap is small. Then this result along with that implies that, that there is a transition of the overlap function at T equal to the minus one third. And it turns out that the noise sensitivity counterpart of this result showing that there is decorrelation for large times is still open and, and will require actually new ideas. Uh, so any, any questions about, uh, about the statement or of this, of the setup? Okay. Uh, uh, and so, uh, so in the next couple of slides, I'll at least present a heuristic argument explaining why n to the minus one third is a critical location. And, and actually the proof will not quite follow that heuristic, but this would be instructive nonetheless. And, and to do that, actually, it will be easier to do it in a discrete model. So instead of working with Brownian motions and and little bit diffusions, we'll think about the discrete algorithm model that I outlined, and, and let's look at a dynamical model that let's say every vortex weight is, is randomized at weight one. So every every vortex has a has a Poisson clock attached to that, and whenever the clock rings, you simply replace the vortex weight by a, a independent Fred sample. Okay, so so this was the discrete algorithm model, and so this was let's say the geodesic. So why is n to the minus one third the right location? So recall that the fluctuation of the energy of this path is n to the one third. This was this one third exponent from this KPC theory. Now by time n to the minus one third, uh, the number of bits along this path that get, that get resampled is n to the two thirds. Right? So there are n bits, each of them get resampled at weight one. So by time n to the minus one third, the number of bits that get resampled uh, uh, is n to the two thirds. Now, the geodesic is trying to maximize weight. So it's passing through regions where the vortex weights are typically high. But once you resample them, they get to typical values. So somehow the weight of the geodesic is falling a little short of what it used to be. So to make up for this, what it does is it locally has this reroutings. So, so somehow this weight that's resampled goes down in value. And so you have this reroutings to make up for this loss. However, these reroutings are very local and somehow they are behaving roughly in an IID way. So there is a sort of cumulative CLT type effect. So which means that you have n to the two third of these uh, reroutings, each happening recently in an independent fashion. So the total effect of this change is square root of the number of reroutings, which is square root of n to the two thirds. And this is exactly n to the one third that matches the fluctuation behavior of the system itself. So that's why this is um, the right location where the the net effect of this changes, local changes with the cancellation um, matches the fluctuation behavior of the system at stationarity. Okay, but, but this is again a, a heuristic argument which actually the proof does not quite follow. And, and this was actually predicted in the physics literature in 2004 by Jasul Vera Kushal. And as I mentioned, the actual proof takes a rather different route. Um, so how much time do you have left actually can somebody uh, you have about uh, seven minutes left. Okay, sounds good. Thanks. Um, okay, so uh, so let, just to sort of give a very brief overview of what the actual group does. Um, so the basic difficulty is that this geodesics at time zero and time t live on different time slices, and so comparing them is difficult. And so the key method is to reduce it to a static problem. So instead of working with two geodesics which live on two different time slices, uh, what we do is define a shadow of the geodesic at time t. So, so look at the figure. So let's say the red path is the geodesic at time zero. The blue path is let's say the geodesic at time t. And so what the proof does is defines the shadow of the geodesic at time t, the blue path, the shadow of it is the green path, and that we denote by gamma n t two zero. So this is supposed to be a proxy for the geodesic at time t, but crucially it lives at time zero. 
And so the construction of this proxy is actually very non-trivial and relies on a delicate analysis of the expression structure between the geodesics at time zero and time t. So we'll not get into that. But it, but it has two key properties. So one is a geometric property. So we want the proxy at time zero of the geodesic at time t to be geometrically close to the geodesic at time t. So in particular, we want the size of the excursions between the geodesics at time zero and time t to be roughly preserved. So the excursion between the two geodesics is also the same roughly as the excursion between the geodesic and the proxy. So in particular, this implies that the overlap between the two geodesics was small. That would mean that the overlap between the proxy and the geodesic at time zero, but crucially, these two objects both live at the same time slice. That's also small. So that's the first property that you want to ensure. And the second is weight mimicry. So you want the geodesic at time t and the proxy at time zero to also have the same similar weight. And, and to ensure that we use the fact that the time that we're working with is small. And so this uh, allows us to use this harmonic analytic input of subcritical weight stability. Uh, so, so now I can completely do away with the blue path. So in the original picture, you have this red pattern, the blue path, and they were living in two different time slices. But now we have uh, completely reduced it to a problem where you have time zero, uh, environment, you have the red path and you have the green path. The green path is a proxy for the blue path. And, and you want to rule out a situation like this where the red and the green path are very disjoint. They don't overlap much. But the energy of the green path is very close to the energy of the red path. And uh, this is something that it's a static problem. And, you, and, 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 to do, and once, you can, once you develop a reasonable legal understa uh, understanding of the energy landscape at time zero, you can attempt to answer such questions. And it turns out that, in fact, this can be done for Brownian LPP. Uh, and, uh, uh, so it turns out that it's quite unlikely that uh, you have these two paths, one of them being the geodesic, the other one uh, is a near geodesic, uh, but it's quite disjoint. So that's actually quite unlikely. However, the actual proof is actually still quite different in the sense that um, the energy of this Proxy is actually not quite close to the energy of the geodesic at time t, because that's actually not something that you can achieve. Instead, what actually turns out to be the case is that the difference in the energy of the proxy and the geodesic at time t is much smaller compared to the difference in the energy of the proxy and the geodesic at time zero. So in particular, uh, the, the error that you incur from going from the blue to the green path is negligible compared to the difference in the energy between the green and the red path. So, so, so this, Weight mimic for the purpose of the weight mimicry, this uh, slightly weaker notion still suffices. Uh, okay. Um, so it turns out that uh, once you uh, get a reasonably good understanding of the energy landscape, you can also ask other related questions about uh, geodesic behavior. Uh, so, for example, you can look at a setting like this. So, let's take two points downstairs, minus one and one, let's say. And let's say you take a point x upstairs and so look at geodesics going from x to minus one and one. Now, as I said, they will typically tend to coalesce for a while and, and then eventually bifurcate. Uh, but, uh, but because there are uncountably x as you vary x on this upper line, it turns out there will be an exceptional set of points x which will admit uh, 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 a non coalescence behavior in the sense that it will admit two disjoint geodesics which do not meet at any point except the study. And so you can ask uh, what is sort of the, so these are exceptional sets you can ask about uh, what are the fractal dimensions and, and, and you can look at other related sets of uh, fractal behavior. And so uh, using related ideas about understanding uh, the energy landscape with different groups of people like uh, Riti Basu, Eric Bates, Alan Hammond and Milith Higbe, for this particular example, we showed that the Hustle dimension of the set of exceptional points is one half and in particular, uh, this set of exceptional points is uh, the support of a random measure, and that random measure is closely connected to uh, Brownian local time. Uh, so yeah, so that's pretty much all I wanted to say. So the, uh, the broad message is uh, uh, you have this integral inputs which give you their sharp exponents governing fluctuation of the geodesics and, 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 the, and the variance of the fluctuation of the weights of the geodesics. And, and using that, along with some harmonic analysis and some Proportion theoretic arguments, you can say non trivial geometric statements about how certain growth models uh, behave. Uh, yeah, so, so I'll, I guess I'll, I'll stop here.
Okay, thank you, Shushindu, for this uh, nice talk. Uh, questions? Yes, please, Christoph. Uh, hi. <clears throat> I think you, you mentioned maybe something along those, nice, those lines, but uh, now that you have the chaoticity of the, of the geodesics, Mm -hmm. uh, can you extract uh, the fact that once you pass the n to the minus uh, one third threshold, the fact that the, the values of the best energy uh, gets completely uh, decorrelated from the time yeah, zero energy? Right, so yeah, that's something that I've thought about. So uh, it turns out that, um, so, so what the chaotic statement tells you is that the geodesy stops overlapping with the time zero geodesic. Uh, so what actually needs to be, uh, so if you can actually show a stronger statement that not only does it not overlap, but it's also actually macroscopically separated. So it can happen that the two geodesics are actually very close to each other, and but they don't quite overlap. Uh, but if you can rule that behavior out and actually show that not only do they not overlap, but once it passes a threshold, then the two geodesics actually look macroscopically different in the sense of this figure that I have drawn. So let me just go back a few slides. Uh, Sorry. Uh, yeah, so so if you can show that actually the two judices behave look like this in the sense that they not only they don't even come close to each other, then actually you can show that they the weights actually indeed decorrelate. But you have to rule out this, um, like of course it does not happen, but you still have to rule out the fact that the blue path stays very close to the red path, but does not quite overlap. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions? Any questions from the online audience? Okay, so let's, let's thank uh, Shishindu again and all the speakers of the session.